Hi everyone, this is Joe. Today we're going to make a character out of this book. This is Star Trek Adventures Captain's Log. It's a solo role-playing game. So it's kind of interesting how things come about in the social media sphere, in podcast, and YouTube, and stuff like that. Um, it seems like there's this topic that all of a sudden everybody's talking about and it wasn't planned and it's not people copying off the other. It's just like this weird coincidence. And this one's about solo role playing. So if you don't have a group, if you don't have a GM, if you don't have other players, this is a way you can play with yourself. I'm not going to change that. You know what I mean. Um, yeah, and all of a sudden everyone's talking about it. I've had this episode planned for a while now, so it's actually kind of funny. Um, this episode came about because I got this get, I got this book as a gift. And I was like, oh, I love Star Trek. I don't know if, if you've listened to the show for any amount of time, you know I'm a huge Star Trek nerd. Um, you know, the Star Trek people, Star Wars people, I'm definitely a Trek person, but I'm not anti Star Wars. I, I've watched all the movies. I haven't watched every series and everything. That's going a little over the top. Although, I have watched every Star Trek movie and every Star Trek series, but there's a lot fewer of those than Star Wars. So I got this book, and it's been sitting on my shelf since I got it. And I was like, yeah, I really want to experience it, and I should make a character. And I find uh, doing episodes that are character generation are good. Because they're like a mini review, but rather than me giving me my your yeah, rather than me giving you my opinion, you can just follow along the process and come up with a concept and say, yeah, that works for me, or that doesn't work for me. So before we start making the character, let me talk a little bit about the game system. All right. So the game system is called 2D20. And that's because in task resolution, you roll 2D, 2D20. But we'll get to that in a second. It's by Modifius, and they use the same system and several other uh, game systems. In fact, I uh, just heard from Jason from the Nerds RPG Variety Cast today that they're going to be doing a battle, not a battle star, I wish, a um, Space 1999 uh, role playing game using the 2D20 engine. I wonder if it'll be just. Space 1999, or they'll roll together all the other uh, old uh, ITC, IDC, ITC <laughs> uh, products, uh, you know, like Moonbase and Thunderbirds and everything. Uh, I read a fan theory thing once where all those can co coexist in the same world, but television production being what it is, they might be owned by, the properties might be owned by different companies. Anyway, I'm getting way off track. Um, so, the 2D20 system, characters are defined by traits, attributes, disciplines, focuses, and values. Traits are like, well, the most basic one is, I'm human. Everyone has at least one trait, and it's their, their race. Some people might say, I'm Vulcan. I don't know why you'd want to be Vulcan, but hey, that's me. Um, other people, you might have another trait, like Jordy LaForge, if you ever watched The Next Generation, he had a trait of being blind, you know, and being reliant on the visor. Um, you know, stuff like that. Attributes, there's six attributes. Attributes are a lot like and not at all like D&D at the same time, but we're going to talk about those separately in a second. Disciplines are like skill groups. They're very broad skill groups. There are six of them. We'll talk about them a little more in depth in just a minute, too. Focuses are what I would almost call a specialty in other games. Uh, so underneath your skill group, there are sub-skills, but there's no list. It's open-ended. And like we said last episode, I love open-ended stuff, right? It's it's my, it's my thing. Uh, limiting me down to a list, I mean, I can do it, but it makes me sad. I like being open-ended, being able just to come up with stuff. Although they do have a lot of lists in the book that if that's your jam, you can just pick something or even roll something if you don't want to pick. There's tables for them. The other interesting thing about focuses is that they don't actually have to relate to one of the skill groups. Like, for example, in Next Generation, Riker had the focus of trombone, not trombone, yeah, trombone player. And in the original series, Spock had the focus of three-dimensional chess player. It's just a thing. And who knows? It might come in useful. 
Um, and the last thing is values. Values aren't like numbers, like one, two, three, four, five, six, anything like that. Values are your personal morality. They are a personal value, and they might be positive, they might be negative. Of course, the best ones are just there, and they can be positive or negative depending on the circumstance. A good example might be um, in Star Trek V, uh, Kirk's statement, I, I hate Klingons. I'll never be able to forgive them for killing my son. You know, that thing. That's, that's a personal value. Yeah. Oh, so the attributes. We're going to talk about the attributes. So there's six of them. You know, D&D was my first role-playing game. D&D is the big white elephant in the room. It's what everyone knows. So it's good to align these things with D&D, but of course, it's not an exact alignment. So the first attribute is control. And control might be considered half of dex and half of wisdom. So the part of so self-control, I mean, yeah, control might be considered self-control. So under that aspect, it's wisdom, you know, keeping your cool under fire, uh, keeping me mellow when you're losing your temper, stuff like that. It's also fine motor control. Like if you wanted to thread a needle in this game, not quite sure why that would come up, but if you wanted to thread a needle, that wouldn't be like a dex check, that would be a control check. The next attribute is daring, and there's no equivalent of this in d and This is uh, how decisive you are, this is how fearless you are. Uh, I would say that Kirk has a high daring. Next one is fitness. In D&D, this would be your strength, it would be the other half of dex, this would be con, all kind of rolled together in one. In GURPS, it would be like everything except for IQ, all rolled together in one. In TriStat, this would be your body stat. It's an overall measure of your physical fitness, your strength, your agility, all that stuff. The fourth attribute is called insight. And insight is like that other half of dex. It's perception. It's did I notice that thing over there? But beyond that, it's also perception of uh, people. You know, is he lying to me? Is he hiding something? Is he upset? Is, is she happy? All that, that would be insight. The fifth attribute is called presence. Straight up, this is charisma from D&D. This is your leadership. This is your uh, strength of will. This is your your character, like when you come into a room, does everyone notice you? Uh, not because necessarily you're great looking, but because you have that personality that demands attention. And the last, the sixth of the six attributes is called reason. Straight up, I would compare this to intelligence. This is your ability to figure out problems and all that fun stuff. So those are the attributes. Uh, the other thing I was going to talk about are the Disciplines, like I said, these are very broad skill groups because this is Star Trek, because Star Trek takes place on spaceships or maybe a space station. They are simply the six departments uh, on the ship. Command, you know, your, your yellow shirt people, the people that are in charge of everything. Um, con, you know, like when they say, you have the con, Mr. Sulu, or whatever. <laughs> uh, this is in GURPS space. We call this starship operations. This is pretty much just knowing how a starship works. This is being able to fly it. This is being able to uh, fire the weapons from the bridge. This is, it's all that stuff. Everyone on the bridge has, they're, they're con people. Engineering, of course, that's fixing things, making things, all that fun stuff. Medical, that's going to be Dr. McCoy, Dr. Bashir, the holographic doctor, Dr. Crusher, all your doctors. That's, that's medical. That's, that's pretty self-explanatory. Next one is security. Again, self-explanatory. Doesn't need, need to say anything else about it. And the last one is science, another one that's pretty self-explanatory. Now that we have all these things, how do they come into play? So pretty much your attributes and your discipline have numerical ratings. Attributes start at seven, which is mediocre. Uh, and at eight, that would be like fair, you know, that's average. And they go up to 12, 12 would be like awesome and amazing. Your, I keep wanting to call them skills. 
your disciplines uh, start at one and they go up to five. So let's say you have an engineering of four, so you're a pretty good engineer, and you have a reasoning of 10, and you're doing like a repair job or a troubleshooting job that you, because there is no GM, <laughs> have decided will take um, those two you know, together. So reasoning of 10 and an engineering of four, that's 14. So you roll two 20-sided dice, that's why the system's called 2D20, and if, if they're both under 14, well, 14 or under, if they're both under the target number, then you have two successes. If only one of them is under the target number, you only have one success. And if none of them are under the target number, you have no successes and you failed. You only need one, ta one success to pass most tasks. If both of them are successes, you get something called momentum, which is pretty much just a fudge point and fudge or a Benny in uh, Savage Worlds, kind of like that. If either one of the dice are 20, you also get momentum. If none of the dice succeeded, if they both failed on you, you get something called something, threat, I think it's called, and it's kind of like anti-Benny. Um, yeah, and so that, oh, uh, if you have a focus that would come into play, uh, you get a benefit on your die roll there. Pretty much if you succeed, you automatically get to create an advantage. Uh, it's pretty much one of those things you can do with a, f a fudge point and fudge, right, saying, um, oh, hey, someone showed up that I knew, and he's going to be an ally and help me, or whatever. Um, and if you can't come up with something, there's a table. There are a, a bunch of this book is tables. If you can't come up with an idea to roll on, and again, because it's made to play with yourself, there's a lot of tables to roll on to help you determine if things uh, succeed or fail and all that fun stuff. And I might actually use them in other episodes and explore some of them. So that's how the game system works. <laughs> that's how characters work. Before we make the character, I told you last episode that I like to do a concept first. So my concept for this character is, well, he's the captain of the ship. Um, originally, I was going to make that the case because I was thinking that's kind of munchkin-y and everything. But I, then I remembered, no, no, this is playing with myself. If I were with a group, I would never do that. But because it's playing with myself, of course, you're going to be Kirk. Who else would you be, right? It's going to be original series. I know a lot of people would say Spock. I don't get it. Anyway, um, it's going to be original series. It's going to be a class scout ship because that's the kind of ship I am using for um, my shirts and skirts game that I think I'm going to run. I've been writing a little adventure for that. Um, oh, and so uh, what I'm thinking for his backstory, like I said, he's human. He grew up on this uh, colony, uh, kind of a frontier. You know, everyone always comes from like Kirk is from Iowa and Cisco is from Louisiana and all this stuff. They're always from very boring places. Uh, Janeway was from like Idaho or something, I think. Um, Picard was from France with a British accent. Um, <laughs> but I mean, they're visiting these colonies all the time. So why can't I have a character that grew up on one of these colonies? So he grew up on a, a colony. It was a rough growing up. Um, it made him maybe a little uh, less focused when he was first in the academy and maybe for his first, uh, and yeah, by, by the time he graduates from the academy, he has kind of a wake-up call and uh, he gets serious with his life and it goes on there. Um, as a kid, I pictured he had this love interest. Uh, she was on, oh, my character's a he, mainly because <laughs> the last character I did was... Uh, a female and uh, for the Trugan clans episode. And like I said, uh, when I'm trying to do a gender for a character, I just take whatever I did last and flip it. So that was a she, this one's a he. Um, so, uh, yeah, a resupply ship would visit them every so often with like supplies, check up on how the colony was doing and stuff. And there was a, not a crew member because age difference. There was a family member, um, a daughter of the captain, maybe, uh, that he fell in love with. And 
uh, kind of inspired by O. Henry's Gift of the Magi. Uh, when he was becoming of age, he was going to surprise her by joining Starfleet, and she was supplying him, uh, surprising him by joining the colony. And so their paths crossed, and they pretty much never saw each other again. Um, yeah, so that's his kind of backstory. Uh, like I said, he's going to be a captain. He's going to be big into leadership. Um, on the colony, he probably did some engineering type stuff. So that's going to be the other part of his background. And so as I'm going through the character generation process, we're going to be looking at, you know, engineering, command, uh, colony world, stuff like that. Okay. Um, we're going to get into character generation right now. I am going to be using an online character generator. I checked it out. It follows the book. Really, I didn't see any place where they differed, really. Uh, but I will have the book with me to look stuff up. So if you're watching on YouTube, everything's about to change because I'm going to let you see the character generator as I'm doing it. If you're just listening on the podcast, that's fine. I'm going to be de describing everything as I go along. Uh, the character generation, actually, there's two methods in the book. One is... <laughs> one is life path, which is the default method, which is what I'm going to be doing. The other one is another thing I like to do a lot, though, is um, what they call it ad hoc. I don't remember the term they use for it, but it's pretty much making it up as you go along. Start with almost nothing for your character, you know, just a few things. And then as things present themselves in the game, pick something and write it down and then it becomes a thing. Pretty much you're retconning your character into existence. Uh, it's something I first read about in Fudge years and years ago, and I liked it. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do. So let's get to it. Hey, down here. <laughs> I'm in the lower left-hand corner. Um, by the way, you notice I changed glasses. That's because these are my computer distance glasses. Getting old sucks. <laughs> anyway, um, the URL for this character creator is STA, as in Star Trek Adventures, dot bc homes like sherlock holmes only bc homes dot org uh they did a great job on this check it out uh like i said i've i do have my book with me in case i need to double check anything while we're doing this but uh like i said i i went through this before the show of course and i didn't see anything anything wrong with it so i have a lot of faith in it I will put a link to it in the show notes, both YouTube and the podcast, so uh, you can get to it if you are interested. The character generator, besides letting us create characters, uh, also lets us create tokens. So if you're playing on Roll20 or some other virtual tabletop, uh, it will make the tokens for you with a picture of your character, and it has all this whole little creator there. It's actually pretty cool. Um, and it lets you make characters in spaceships, which is what we're doing. Uh, we're going to make a character, so click there. The first screen lets you select which references you're using. Because Star Trek Adventures has been out for a while, there's lots of campaign books, there's lots of splat books, there's lots of core books, all that fun stuff. The only one we're using is Captain's Log. Uh, the Captain's Log book does say that the rules here differ a little bit from the normal Star Trek Adventures. Uh, because, again, it's designed for solo play, not group play. Uh, one thing I remember them saying is that you're limited in the amount of momentum and threat you have, which isn't the same as uh, the normal game when you're playing with other people instead of playing with yourself. Um, yeah, so we're just going to select that. We made sure everything else wasn't selected. Hi, I moved to the upper left-hand corner now because <laughs> uh, I was hiding part of the screen. Down here, it said uh, solo RPG using the captain's log rules. That is what we're doing. Okay, I'm back down here, lower left-hand corner. Uh, it says, are you creating a character or a starship? We are creating a character. Then it says, select an error for your character. And you can actually have it randomly select one for you. I, so your options are the Enterprise era from, you know... Uh, Enterprise, which was later renamed Star Trek Enterprise, or from the original series era, or the Next Generation era. I would do the original series era. That's me. That's who I am. That's how I roll. The next option we have is to select a race, and there are lots of races. Uh, and these races aren't specific to the era. For example, 
um, even though I said original series, we have Betazoids on here and they don't show up until the next generation. Uh, but there's nothing to say that they weren't around, we just never encountered them. Um, Cation. Oh, Cations. So if I were to play a non human character, I would play a Cation. These are my favorite non human races of the Star Trek universe. Um, in the live action movies, they show up sometimes as cameos, really, really bad makeup, don't look good at all. But they originally showed up in Star Trek The Original Series with Lieutenant Mares, voiced by the inestimable uh, Nichelle Nichols. It was one of the other char extra characters she voiced. Uh, they also show up as the Doctor in uh, Star Trek Lower Decks. But, uh, you know, when I was given my backstory about the character having a romance when he was growing up, maybe she's a Cation. I could do that. I like that. Um... Uh, well, oh, if you've never seen uh, Star Trek, the animated series, or Lower Decks, uh, Cations are cat-like people. And actually, they've both been female, so are they cat girls? Oh, uh, no, in the live-action movies, they show males. But there's also Kazinti from um, Larry Niven's books show up in the Star Trek universe. So, I don't know. But anyway, I'm a human. Always been a human. Um... Here it gives some flavor text to say what humans are, but what it boils down to, the only effect that species really has when you're making a character is that you get a boost in three attributes. In most races, it says which three they're going to be. In some, you have a choice of four or something like that. For humans, it's always you can choose any of the three. Now, because I said that this character, right, I have this concept, I said that he grew up, he didn't have a lot of self-control, he didn't have a lot of that discipline, that came later. Um, so I'm not going to boost his control, I am going to boost his daring, I am going to boost his uh, fitness, insight, um, that insight to others might have given him more of that, that empathy, more of that control, uh, so I'm not going to do that one. Presence, definitely, maybe. Reason, I'm not going to do that. So pre presence, that matches my concept, right? He's, he's, um, he has his personality. Uh, he thinks he's all that. He doesn't want to really put in a lot of effort. So there. So our next thing is how did he grow up? And it actually lets you pick things like uh, he grew up on a home world or he grew up in a colony or whatever. However, instead of doing that, there's also an option to say what kind of conditions did he grow up in, and I like that better because it makes some assumptions that if you grew up in a home world that it was grand and luxurious and all that stuff, but maybe it was a struggle. So I am, uh, even though I said a colony, I'm in the upper right now. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go with struggle and hardship because that's the kind of colony he was in. They were trying to survive. They, right? It was a frontier place. Uh, so the flavor text says, for one reason or another, your home world had few available resources, worlds on the frontier, blah, blah, blah. Hardship, survival is difficult. So yeah. So th what this affects is what attributes and disciplines get a boost. So at creation, every discipline is a one and every attribute starts as a seven. And as you go through this life path, they can increase. This is still in his childhood phase, uh, so he doesn't have that. Uh, so yeah, I'm saying daring again. Um, yeah, it just it makes sense. That's him, and it was tough, so he had to do uh, things to survive in this harsh uh, place to survive. Uh, disciplines select one. Uh, options are Khan. Like I said, Khan is starship operations. Doesn't make a lot of sense if he's on a if he's on a planet. Science, maybe, but I said engineering, right? He's jerry-rigging jerry a lot of things around the colony to make things work, to make ends meet. So that's definitely the one don't have to give a thought. Value. Now, to reflect that, that thought I had about him being a little immature in the beginning, I'm going to give him a very immature value here. Um, and I think that will make for interesting play later on. And I'm going to say, oh, but I will say, if you can't come up with something, there's a little thing where we'll select one. Just uh, you must walk barefoot in the dirt to really understand the a world. Um, yeah, that's 
that's not him. A good mystery is irresistible. That's also, but what I'm going to pick is kind of a negative one uh, because it matches the personality. And what I picked is if I don't do it, someone else will. So the next thing is early outlook. And again, you can do it by the way that he was uh, brought up. Uh, like it would probably be agricultural or rural considering the colony he grew up with. Uh, but other options are like artistic or business or, you know, stuff like that. Um, another way to do it is by castes. You could say he grew up uh, in an academic environment in terms of like not a hard cast like, like old societies used to be with unbreakable caste systems, but just, you know, what was the type of people around him. Or aspirations. Um, again, so if I were going to go with upbringing, I would go with agricultural or rural. If I were going to go with... Um, Cast, I would go with agricultural, but I am going to go with aspirations. Um, and it is, so the options for aspirations are to create, to discover, to explore, to fly, to prosper, to protect. And like I said, it was a struggling colony um, where survival was questionable with, you know, why are we going to make it? So I am picking to prosper, and not prosper as in to get rich, but prosper as in to have enough crops to survive the next season. And each one of these gives you different options as to what disciplines or attributes they came up. I'm not looking at those. I am just going with my character concept and letting all that fall where it, way, where it falls. Um, <clears throat> And then you have the option to say, yes, I accepted this upbringing. You know, I accepted this, this outlook or I rejected it. I'm like, no, that's not right. I'm going to like if you grew up in a warrior society like the Andorians, maybe uh, you could say, no, I'm a pacifist. Right. But he accepts it. Um, <laughs> he wants to survive the next season. He just wants someone else to do the work to make it happen. Uh, so he accepted it. Disciplines and attributes. So uh, no choice for attributes already selecting. So we got a plus two on daring and a plus two on presence. He currently has a 10 in both of those now. Wow, uh, going a little over the top there. Disciplines, uh, command con, engineering might make sense. Uh, I get to choose one, uh, pretty much of all the six. Um, I'm gonna say command. Uh, he had a group of friends because he has this presence. They looked up to him um, and gave him some command. And that fits with uh, my vision of him for the future as well. Focus. Uh, focus should relate to the way you intend to make your way in the galaxy. Um, so again, a focus is like a specialized skill. It's not a value. It's not something he um, feels. Oh, there is a random option. Let's just see what it... Mental discipline, yeah. Time management, court and rituals. <laughs> uh, no. So he's growing up in this agricultural colony. It's going to be leadership, duh. It's that simple. Okay, the next thing is the type of education. The options are allied military, ambassador, civilian, or Starfleet. Definitely Starfleet. That was the backstory I gave, right? He wanted to surprise his girlfriend by joining Starfleet to be with her. She wanted to surprise him and join the colony to be with him. So Starfleet Academy. A command track, operations track, science track. Like I said, I want him to be a captain. He is going to follow the uh, command track. So we get attribute bumps. Now Starfleet Academy is where he starts growing up. He starts to learn that the world isn't all about him and uh, sometimes you need to step up to make things happen. I could just do, do, do my three low ones and bring them up to average. Um, now, I have said on this show before that I feel that character should have something that's low. Star Trek is an exception. Also, Star Wars would be an exception. There, there's other, there's certain genres where... Um, <laughs> where it makes sense. Because in Star Trek, everyone is hyper-competent. <laughs> everyone on the Enterprise is not only good at what they do, they're like the best at what they do, <laughs> right? 
The one exception of all the shows that I can come up with, the one exception is Barkley, Reginald Barkley. Uh, he was on Deep Space Nine, later shows up on Voyager. Um, he and he probably is the closest that represents me, right? He he's an introvert, uh, doesn't socialize well, uh, hides away in the holodeck. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, so the one character that isn't hyper competent but is still very competent, they play off for comedic effect. So it is in genre to say no low stats. So. Anyone who wants to harass me for going no low stats on this character, feel free. Comments below or feedback at decahedron.com. <laughs> so, but it makes sense, right? Because I said this is where he's starting to grow up. So he's learning that self-control. So that's one that he picks up there. Learning that insight to interact with other people that it's not all about him. So it makes sense. And that reasoning. I mean, all three of these even make sense story-wise. So I don't think I'm... Much getting out here. Primary discipline. Command. Command would make sense because he's on the command track. But he needs to know how to run a starship. And to run a starship, you need con. And I imagine he's in a situation where lots of other people grew up around starships and stuff. And he didn't. So I'm picking con. Whoa, that's a plus two jump. I did not realize that. Oh, because that's the primary. And then tough call between command and engineering. But I said he came up through the engineering track. Um, so even though my intent for him is to have highest con con command, right now his highest is both con and engineering. That's actually kind of funny. Uh, focuses. So these are the focuses that he picked up in Starfleet Academy. Oh, just out of curiosity, let's let it roll them. Strafing runs, combat maneuvers, and space walks. Uh, maybe combat maneuvers. I kind of like that one. Uh, but the other two, I am not going to stick with. In fact, even combat maneuvers, I am going to change that to strategy. Uh, engineering. Let's say he's less of the the build up from scratch type, and the more from the more of the uh, I can fix anything type. So we will call it jury rigging. Is it jury rigging or jerry rigging? Like a jerry can? I don't know. If I'm wrong, let me know. Um, and then the last one. Uh, whoops. All right. So I'm actually going to look in the book right now just to look at some of the suggestions it says for Khan. I'm picking Starfleet Martial Arts. Uh, it was an elective at the Academy. That's where Kirk learned his little, little two-fisted punch thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Yep, that's what I'm going with. And value. So, <laughs> oh, I got one. It just came to my head. It's perfect. <laughs> it's lead, follow, or get out of the way. Um, it kind of conflicts with this other value that if I don't do it, somebody else will. Uh, but that's okay. Values are allowed to conflict. People are, are, are like that. Um, <laughs> and lead, follow, get out of the way. That's kind of personal to me. When I was a young man and I joined the United States Air Force, I was in the 3701st Training Squadron, and that was their motto, uh, lead, follow, or get out of the way for basic training. So that is why I'm picking that. Whoops. What did I pick? Oh, I get two disciplines. All right. Yeah, I'm picking command to bring command up to where it belongs. Nice. Nice. The next thing you have to pick is if you're a novice, if you're experienced, or if you're a veteran. I don't really think this has anything to do with char character generation. It doesn't change anything which comes next. I'm selecting veteran because as a Starship captain, they don't give that to novices. One of the things I did not like about the J.J. Abrams movie <laughs> and uh, not even experience. I think you have to be pretty good to be a veteran. Uh, James T. Kirk was the youngest captain in Starfleet at the time of the original series. So there you go. Your character has decades of experience and served as many starships and star bases. Yep. Um, value. So the value I have in mind is like something like we're all in this together. And I don't know that's how does that differ from my my first two? Now I'm gonna go is I won't give a command, I wouldn't follow. That was some advice given to me as a very young man by uh, my brother-in-law, uh, Bill, who has 
passed a couple of years ago, uh, but it was good life, good life advice, and I think it would fit well with this uh, character. The next thing is a career event. You get to pick two dramatic things from the character's backstory that like really set his, his life in action. The options are ship destroyed, which I'm leaning at towards, uh, death of a friend, lauded by another culture, negotiated a treaty, required to take command. I'm strongly leaning towards that too. I could see that being his big coming of age moment. Um, encounter with a truly alien being, maybe serious injury, conflict with a hostile culture, mentored, I like it, maybe. Transporter accident, dealing with a plague, betrayed ideals for a superior, called out by a superior, oh, sorry, called out a superior, new battle strategy, learns a unique language, discovers an artifact, special commendation, solved an engineering crisis, breakthrough or invention or first contact. So I like dealing with a plague and I'm thinking not even in Starfleet, this was in the colony when he was growing up. So I'm gonna select that one. Uh, and that gives me a plus one to my insight and a plus one to my medicine and a uh, focus. I don't want him to be like a hardcore medic, but I could see this giving him some uh, skill, some skill and actually it's even one of the ones suggested one in a triage. That's something that speaks to me real life. Uh, that's one of the trainings I would get all the time in the Air Force. So ship destroyed and required to take command. I actually had pictured both of those and as being the same incident. Um, he was required to take command, then the ship was destroyed. Uh, I could see that being big, uh, but I'm just gonna take required to take command. Wow, that has raised his, that's giving him a plus one to his daring, which is now an 11. Um, and his discipline is now a four. I mean, sorry, his command is now a four, which works for me. And his focus for this, when he was uh, required to take command, let's say, let's say it was during combat, uh, ship to ship combat, and the captain was killed and he had to take command of the ship and uh, trial by fire, he had to learn some starship tactics, combat tactics, right? And then we have finishing touches. It's the last step. And pretty much you just get to add two disciplines and two attributes to anything to balance out your character. Uh, so right now, before I do anything, he has a control of eight, which is average, a daring of 11, which is very high, uh, fitness of eight, insight of nine, presence of 10, and reason of eight. Um, you're only allowed one thing that's a 12 or higher. He's actually more daring than I originally envisioned him. <laughs> um, presence, I wanted a high presence, that's good at 10. Uh, control eight, average, I, I'm okay with things being average. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, uh, so I'm going with insight because I, he, he's a good leader, right? I picture him being able to re relate with people well. The presence helps with that, but insight helps as well. And reason, I like reason. And discipline, I get to select two. Currently he has a command of four, a con of three, an engineering of three, a security of one, a science of one, and a medicine of two. So it's just like I said, command was highest and engineering and con, that, it, that all makes sense. So uh, I could boost these low ones, but I don't think I'm going to. Uh, he's not a scientist. It doesn't, I mean, a one of science makes sense. And security of one, I could see boost in that one. Actually, I think I will boost that one. Uh, and then the other one's command. That's the top of that command can be. He's a starship captain, it makes sense. So yes, that is, that is what that is. Uh, and a value, one more value. Value is giving me the hardest struggle. Actually, let me uh, see a random one. Push me too far and you'll see my ugly side. <laughs> is, that, is that their way of saying, don't make me angry. You won't like me very much when I'm angry. <laughs> um, I like that it's, uh, oh, 
Oh. So there's this song called uh, Wenton Soldier. It was by a group called Coven way back in the 60s or 70s, I don't know. And uh, it was the theme song to some violent movie. But uh, if you listen to it on the surface, it sounds like a peace song out of the 60s, one of those, you know, 60s hippies peace song. Go ahead and lo- hate you. Go ahead and hate your neighbor. Go ahead and cheat a friend. Anyway, um, but when you reflect on the lyrics, it's actually, <laughs> uh, so the, the, the story behind the, the story behind the song is that uh, there's a people living up on a mountain who are very peaceful people who are rumored to have a treasure. And then there's people living in the valley who want the treasure. So they come up and they say, give us your treasure. And the people up on the mountain say, well, we'll, we'll share it with you. You know, it's, it's for everyone. <laughs> and the people in the valley are like, not good enough. And so they kill them all. <laughs> and uh, then they take the treasure, which... Uh, they dig up the treasure, and uh, it's a stone. Peace on earth was all it said. Um, so it sounds like a peace song when you first think about it, but if you think about it, it's saying that one-sided pacifism does not work. Uh, and so that's going to be his value. Um, I just need a better way to word that. Pacifism only works if everyone agrees. That's what I went with. Um, so I think I think that's our typical... Starfleet Starship Captain, right? Uh, go in, go with the negotiation. If they, if they say no, you, you blast them to heck if you have to. Yep, that's uh, that's his last value. Okay. Final touches are name and stuff like that. Assignment is a commanding officer. Name. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just going to ask... AI. I'm saying, uh, please provide a list of 10 Hawaiian male names. Uh, so it's giving me a list. I'm just looking them over. One of the names is uh, Keone, which is the Hawaiian form of John. I like it. I'm just asking the AI for some surnames. Akana. Keone Akana. I like it. That's what I'm going with. And Rank, he is... You know, I'm tempted to make him a commander because the ship I have envisioned for him is a smaller ship. So maybe it doesn't have a captain as captain. Maybe it has a commander as captain, as skipper, if you will. Um, yeah, six one half dozen the other. It's it's just character thing. I'm going to do that. He's a commander, and then it lets you look at the character, Commander Keone Akana is a human, his upbringing, uh, he agreed with the environment, which was uh, to prosper, the aspirations there. The environment was struggling with hardship. His education was a command track at Starfleet Academy. His current assignment is a commanding officer, and he is a human. His attributes are control eight, that's average, fitness eight, that's average, presence 10, that's above average, daring 11, that's very above average. Insight 10 and reason 9. His disciplines are command 5. That's as high as that can be. His disciplines are command 5. That's as high as that can be. His con is 3. His security is 2. His engineering is 3. His science is 1. And his medicine is 2. His values are, if I don't do it, someone else will. <laughs> That's kind of a negative one. And it doesn't match the rest, but, you know, not everybody's perfect. Lead, follow, or get out of the way. I won't give a command that I wouldn't follow. And pacifism only works if everyone agrees. If both sides agree, yeah, whatever. And his focuses are leadership, jury rigging, strategy, Starfleet martial arts, triage, and starship tactics. Um, And that is the character. And this program even lets you export it to a PDF, which is pretty nifty. Uh, and if you are on my Discord, I will post up there for people to see if you want. So that is it. That is the character. I This episode has gone long, so I'm going to wrap it up here. What do you think of Star Trek Adventures Captain's Log? I think 
haven't gone through this system, I think it's pretty cool. I think the mechanics are a bit heavier than I would personally lean to for a uh, playing by myself game. Um, I think this book is very thick <laughs> for what it does. Um, a lot of it is just what Star Trek is. Um, like half of it, which is page filler. If you don't know that, you're probably not wanting to play a Star Trek game. Um, and if you do know it, <laughs> what they came up with might not match what your thoughts are. So, um, in which case, you're probably going to ignore it and run with what you want. So, so as a value, would I buy this book? I am not sure. Um, but as a gift, it was okay. Another neat thing that Modifius does is if you buy the book, send them the receipt, and they'll send you a PDF for free. That's very cool of them. Um, so, yeah, that's actually cool. I'm not sure I would buy it, but I have it. It looks cool, and uh, I'll give it a try. It has some like adventure generation stuff in it, too, that I might do future episodes, and they'll be able to be a lot shorter. So uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Uh, comments, feedback at deckhedron.com, or, or you can call the feedback line, which is... I don't know what it is. <laughs> or it's up in RPG cast. If you're on the you if you're on YouTube, the number is scrolling below, or it's in the show notes if you're on the podcast. Um, and there's say hi dot chat slash Degahedron. All those work to get to me. Thanks again for watching or listening. And until next time, happy gaming, happy life. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Degahedron RPG podcast please come back again to